Morning, everyone. So um, we're going to be discussing Kemi Badnock's little meltdown because she's in a little bit of danger here and I'm not sure she recognises it. So it's related to the post office scandal. Now, I mean, I've said in the past, ultimately what's happened, for those who don't, a really quick update is a new IT system was brought in by the post office years and years ago before the tourists even came to power. It wanted nothing to do with them. Uh, it was called the Horizon IT system. It was developed by Fujitsu. But there were some problems with it. And it came up with differences in the amounts that sub postmasters, the people running individual post offices, were reporting uh, to like central post office and what that sent that system said they should have. And they would say, oh, they're on the take. Oh, they're stealing money. And this was happening a lot. And the, the sub postmasters would ring and they said, no, there must be a mistake here. And they were being told. Well, it's funny how this issue is only affecting you. There's no one else reporting any problems when there were hundreds of people reporting problems. So there were lies straight away. In the end, uh, many of these sub postmasters, hundreds and hundreds of them, were um, convicted of theft, which obviously destroyed their lives, it, literally in one case, um, uh, destroyed relationships. People lost their homes. And then a few years later, some people go in, there's something funny here, there's something a bit fishy. And then even more years later, it all became clear that the post office had been lying. Um, really, the people involved in it, I do not understand why they are not themselves facing contempt of court charges or something like that. But anyway, that's thought of the scandal. We all now know it was a fit up. We can't say for certain that none of the sub postmasters were fiddling with things. We, we we can say that the vast majority of them must be innocent. So now the government have got a, a job dealing with it all. They need to deal with, first of all, the false convictions. They need to deal with compensation because these people lost their homes, their livelihoods. They lost everything. Um, there needs to be a hell of a lot of financial compensation. But that's been going really badly. So what happened was... In, um, tw I think it was towards the end of 2022, a new chair of the post office was appointed called Henry Staunton. He'd had nothing to do with the post office before. He'd like worked for various other organizations. He was uh, a well-respected CEO, as far as I can tell. Uh, and he was specifically headhunted. He didn't apply for the job. He was headhunted by the government to sort out the mess at the post office, right? Um, so he came in and it was all a very chaotic time because this was in like the Liz Trust days, right? I think it was around about those times. And then at a certain point, I think last year, Kemi Badnock sacked him. Now he's gone public by saying she told him when she rang him up or, called, or contacted him, however, to say, sorry, Henry, we're letting you go. And she said it was... Because, or according to him, this is an allegation, she said, someone's got to take the rap for this, right? So the government were starting to be, they were fearing that they were going to cop for some negative political flack as a result of this, right? Which I would argue they would not have had to do as long as they, because the Tories are really good at blaming people, right? They're, that's what they always do. Whenever anything goes wrong, even if it's their fault, blame someone else. With the Horizon scandal, they had an easy way to blame people, and it wouldn't be unjust. There were the people in the post office who deliberately lied, lied to so postmasters, lied to the courts, deliberately went after people that they sort of knew were probably innocent, right? Why didn't the government shine a spotlight on them? Why didn't the government make sure that prosecutions, or at least investigate, because they can't order prosecutions, obviously. That would be a fascist state. But at least order investigations into the, whether they should face prosecution, right? Hand it, you know, tell the CPS, this is a matter of public interest. We want you to sort this out. And um, so anyway, these claims come out by Henry Staunton that he was sacked because someone needed to set it up. But also there were several other allegations as well in a Sunday Times article at the weekend. One of which was that he was told to slow down the compensation, stall the compensation. And he was told why. He was told because the government, the Tories, 
wanted as low a financial liability as possible going into the election. So they were talking about, look, we want we want you to stall the payout of compensation until after the election. All right. OK, that's the accusation. Well, there's several other accusations, as well, but that's a key one. So then Kemi Badenoch fires back or the Department for Business and Trade, but that's her department. So they fire back and they say this. This, this is the tweet. I'll read it out to you before we put something up. Fact check. Right. The government made clear to the chair of the post office that reaching payment settles, settlements with victims of the Horizon scandal was a priority when he took the role. Claims to the contrary are simply not true. Read the full letter below. Now, I've clipped part of that full letter, which claims should be putting up above. And in it, it says, halfway down the letter, I've put a link to the full letter in the description below, by the way. In particular, I would be grateful if you could focus your attention on the following. Number one, effective financial management and performance, including effective management of legal costs to ensure medium term viability. Right. Two, maintain the improving POL's capacity, um, capability and resilience at all levels of the organization, including the top team. Three, engaging positively with the post office horizon IT inquiry and implementing change including resolving historical litigation issues, successfully delivering the strategic platform modernization program and reaching settlements with claimants. So Kemi Badnock thinks because in that third thing, it says reaching settlements with claimants, she can claim that, oh, it's untrue what he's saying, but it's not because at the first one, the, the top priority, including effective management of legal costs to ensure medium term viability. That is exactly what Henry Staunton's claiming, not that the compensation should not be paid out, but that it should be stalled until after the election. That is medium term, isn't it? So her letter is actually backing up. Her letter is backing up what Henry Staunton's claiming. And I'll tell you another thing. I can't put this up because there's all sorts of stuff. But I will try and add the, 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 the links to all of these below later on. I haven't put the links to all of them. So Kemi Badnock fires back with this. So then she also fires back by saying, oh, he's just seeking revenge. I sacked him. He's seeking revenge. And she tries to claim that he was facing an investigation for bullying. Now, here's the thing. If you sack someone for bullying, the investigation's already taken place and the findings have been reported. Yeah. So she's not claiming that. She's claiming that he was facing investigation. In other words, there was there was nothing. If it even happened, there was nothing proven, right? So she can't claim that as a reason for sacking him. But Henry Staunton has fired back. And there's something really interesting. Now, when I did a video on this yesterday, I said the accusations at least merit investigation. And because this isn't one person's word against another, there are lots of other people who would have to be in the know. If you conducted an independent investigation, the truth would come out. But here, here's the thing. It seems that Mr. Staunton's quite a cunning little chappy. So he said, addressing each of the points in turn, and this with this specific point about the compensation claim, it says here, um, firstly, with regard to the comment made, by, uh, made to Mr. Staunton by the senior civil servant to the effect that he was to stall on compensation payments to Horizon victims, and on spend on the horizon replacement so the government could limp into the election with the lowest possible financial liability. Mr. Staunton stands by his comment, which he recorded at the time in a file note, which he emailed to himself and to colleagues, and which is therefore traceable on the post office server. So in other words, there obviously this senior civil servant has told him something like verbally so that's not recorded but he is claiming that at the time it happened he wrote a note about what was said and emailed it to himself and colleagues on that same day so this can't be so in other words an investigation would would be able to come up with that they would find it right and if it was gone and they deleted all copies they would find a record of the deletions right so an, in, an in, independent investigation would find that evidence. Now, as I say, it wouldn't be proof of what was said to him. It would be proof 
that he had written a note to others to that effect on that day, not made it up later. Because Badenoch will be trying to suggest he made this up later just to cover his ass because he got sacked. This would say otherwise. So really what you've got here, unless there is, because basically what Staunton's now saying is, I, there's proof on the IT servers. An independent investigation will find it. That's what he's saying. So unless, in other words, if this becomes a big news issue, is what I'm saying. If it becomes a big news issue, Kemi Badnock cannot just say it's one person's word against another and he's lying and blah, 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 and he's just, you know, trying to get revenge and all the rest of it. Because he's claiming there's evidence on the post office servers. So the only way the government would have of defending against it would be to order an independent inquiry, a proper independent inquiry. Now, of course, they would naturally just want to organize an in-house bodge job. That wouldn't work. Remember, the um, the post office issue is now, you know, it's known to the public. It's quite newsworthy. So if people report on this, it is quite newsworthy. And here's the thing. Kemi Badnock wants to be the next leader of the Conservative Party. Or at least a future leader. And something like this could really damage her reputation. Because some people say when I say things like, oh, has she even got a reputation? It's like... Well, in a way, yes and no, and that's a good thing. Most people don't really know much about her. The Tories' reputation is absolute mud at the moment, but Kemi Badenoch hasn't really done anything up to now to, um, to, to upset the public. But if she gets on the wrong side of this, now here's where I think she's been naive. On the one hand, okay, she recognises that she can't afford to get on the wrong side of this, but on the other hand, the way she's going about it is unwise because she's she's basically tangling with someone who obviously knows what he's doing. The fact that he wrote a note, because this is what you do, by the way, if you don't trust colleagues. I, I've been in this situation before. This is what you do if you don't trust colleagues. Every, every single thing that's said to you that you think later on might be denied, you absolutely make a record of and you make sure other people know it. In fact, sometimes, I'm sure some of you have had to be in this position before, if there's, again, a colleague you don't trust, when there's a verbal conversation, you'll usually say something like, oh, just stick it in an email so I don't forget or something like that. You know, just so that you've got the paper re the, the paper trail, the, the record. So he's obviously done this himself. And he, because he's emailed it to colleagues, they will also have had copies and they will have known that this was the, the case at the time. And if it wasn't, you know, they would have sort of brought it up. Uh, comment here from Rachel. Kemi also always thinks she's the smartest person in the room. Happily, everyone in the room knows she is. Well, here's the thing. I mean, she's certainly naive. I don't think she's necessarily a stupid, like, intellectually. But she's making a mess of this because, first of all, anyone, did people see her a few weeks ago um, on the doing the Sunday morning interviews when she came across as incredibly arrogant? And that's the thing. That's the double-edged sword of the fact that she's not unpopular in the country because most of the public don't know who she is. If she did become conservative leader, they would. She'd, have, she'd be much more prominent. She'd get much more media scrutiny. And people would see her. And she's, you know, you, you think about Boris Johnson was very touchy. Rishi Sunak, very touchy. It's very easy to press their buttons. It's very easy to get them behaving very petulantly. Kemi Badenoch's worse. Can I remind people, if you didn't already know, Kemi Badenoch actually had an argument with the Speaker of the House. You know, Lindsay Hoyle, for all his faults, has occasionally had to, had to pull up ministers for taking the piss, right? And usually what happens is um, Boris Johnson would, for example, go, oh, very sorry. Uh, Rishi Sunak will go, oh, very sorry. Kemi Badenoch, when he did it to her, had an argument with him. Got him really irate. Kemi Badenoch, if, if you think Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak do not like being told no, do not like being told they're wrong, Kemi Badenoch is worse, right? She, she, you know, she is much worse. She really takes, you can, you can describe it as taking no shit, but she, she, she'll take no shit even from people she should do. So. Um, 
bad not may not be stupid, she's deeply unpleasant, but she I think she is very naive. She's very naive. She's I mean, she's still quite young, but she's you know, she's probably old enough to, to at least know how to deal with like um but then I think part of the problem is she was very young when she became an MP. She came in MP, I think, in 2015. She's not had much ministerial experience. And I don't think really she'd had much enough experience in the workplace to really know how to deal with um, conflict, should we say. She doesn't, she doesn't know how to deal with conflict management. So she behaves in a very petulant manner. And, and, and she's getting herself on the wrong side of this now because this guy... If he decides, actually, he's going to fight back, because he did say in the Times article he's not really all that bothered. He's just setting the record straight. He's not that bothered. Well, if it turns out he is all that bothered, she could be making a real rod for her own back here. She's in her 40s. She's old enough. Well, she is in her 40s, but not. I don't think when she became an MP. Let me just check exactly how old she is. Because you don't learn a great deal in Parliament. Um, in terms of like how to, you know, relationship management, you know, ma in a, in the workplace, you learn a great deal more um, because you have to. There are people whom you need on side, even if you technically have authority over them because you need their goodwill. But there are people above you who can be complete dickheads that you that you need to be able to you need to you know, you need to manage both ways in the workplace you need to manage up and down um there's her pissing age so she's age 44 so she was she was only in her 30s when she became an mp should have been like 35 um i'm just i'll have to just double check here i'm pretty sure she became an mp in, yes 2015 is that right oh no oh no no she didn't. 2017. That's even, oh, she, she wasn't even a 2015. She's 2017. So she was still in her 30s then. Uh, she'd have been about 37. I mean, you know, I, I reckon I was about 30 when I finally worked out how to deal with people. All through my 20s, I made a right arse of uh, things because I was a bit hot headed in my 20s. And then in early 30s, I would say, I started to work it all out. Um, but anyway, that's by the by. The point is, she's not experienced at workplace relations. She's not experienced as a minister or, a, you know, like a, a secretary of state, certainly, because she's only been in that for just over a year. So, you know, she doesn't have enough experience of anything in how to deal with like a serious situation like this. And because she's so thin skinned, because she's so arrogant, and and I think she's made. There's a danger. She little Hitler syndrome. There is a danger here. She ends up making a, a huge mess for herself because at the moment I've been quite clear. Politicians were not responsible for the post office scandal. The question is, in terms of responsibility of politicians, what happens once they knew? And there's a couple of dodgy things coming out. First of all, Kemi Badnock is very much in the frame. Second of all, there's a BBC News story today, or last night, I suppose, technically, but today, that the Cameron government, so this is going a long way back, knew that the post office ditched its horizon investigation. So they knew that an investigation which might have proven that these people were innocent was dropped and did nothing. So actually, the Conservatives are now starting to come under fire for this. Uh, Tinkinator, ten pounds super chat. Thank you very much. Says hi. Have I noticed politics? Joe has been putting out a lot of content recently, saying Labour will be far worse than the Tories, and Star Wars turbocharge our march towards fascism. Grifters. Um, th this will happen. Expect this to happen. It's a bit like you know you'll see in the media people saying, "Oh, Labour have had a really torrid time of the last two weeks." Yeah, expect that because we're now into election year, and. Um, all the various sort of forces that want the Tories to win will be out in force now. So expect Labour to come under a ridiculous amount of fire and they need to just stay calm. They need to not be surprised. What's happened over the last couple of weeks is not a surprise in the slightest. I mean, what causes the? But it's going to keep happening. And when the election itself is caused, it's called, it's going to be even worse. This is why I keep saying this is going to be 
this is going to be like the worst uh year and the election campaign is going to be the worst election campaign i think i've ever experienced in this country um it may not be quite as toxic as say the american president the last american presidential election or indeed the one before anything re re uh, involving trump but it may be um there we go um uh oh off topic here a bit off subject as important Sakir Starmer has called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Do I think the SNP will back Labour's motion tomorrow? So, so I did do a video on my own channel about that. I think the SNP are doing this for political advantage because remember, their their opponents are not the Tory party. They are competing with the Tories in a few seats in Scotland, not very many. Their, their main competitors, Labour, and it always has been. The reason why the attacks have started on Labour from them um, which is normal part of party politics, by the way, over the last year or so is because Labour are now credibly challenging Scotland. So the way this parliament has gone, so initially Labour had to rebuild under Starmer, and then you would say round about 2021, um, to the second half of 2021, that's when Labour looked like credible challengers to the Tories. Throughout 2022, they solidified that, helped by the fact that the Tories completely made the wrong decisions every single time. First of all, in holding on to Boris Johnson too long and then in replacing him with the Liz Trust when they finally decided to get rid of him. Um, but even then, Labour was still not making major inroads in Scotland, so the SNP was still like focusing on the Tories. And then in 2023, last year, all of a sudden Labour started to sort of because they started to, I think it's because they started to be seen as credible uh, as a Westminster government across the country. Then you had Nicola Sturgeon stepping down and all the, the mess that followed that. And then Labour started to make inroads in Scotland. And now the SNP recognise uh, that Labour are the parents. So that's what I suspect. They're, they've done this to try and make it difficult for Labour. I think Labour should just have made it a free vote. I said as much in my video. And they can just, if people say to them, well, why didn't you make it a free vote last time? You can say the circumstances have changed. You can say the circumstances now, at the time, at the last time, although we all knew what Netanyahu was really doing, you could say that the Israeli government were just trying to free their hostages. Whereas now you can say, since then, the Israeli government has declared that anyone in Gaza is a target. That includes Palestinian children. They've said are a viable military target. It's like, uh, no. And now they're planning on, they're basically planning on wiping out Palestine. It, it seems clear to me. They've formally rejected the idea of a two-state solution. Do you know what's happening now? I need to check on the details of this. Do you know what's happening right now? We've got, can you believe this? The United States now want a UN, um, a UN statement to call for a ceasefire. So, you know, this is the point we knew would happen. So everyone who's going, oh, Labour's position's changed a bit later. Is it? No, it's changed at just the right time. We knew this would happen because we knew Netanyahu really was being motivated partly by wanting to avoid prison in his own land, which means he needs a... You know how we always say that fascists, you know, when they get in trouble back home, they need a war. They need a war to rally people around them. Well, that's what Netanyahu wants here. He wants a war so that he doesn't have to go to prison. It's a classic case. And we knew it would happen. And now it's gotten to the point where even the US, and I need to look this up properly, even the US now wants a UN resolution <laughs> calling for a ceasefire. So that's where we are. It, it, it's, and, you know, and unfortunately, we needed to have to, we needed this to, to, to get to this point. But there we go. Um, I'll go through a few other comments on, on other things here. Uh, oh, there's some uh, various comments I can't keep up with there. Um, 
They say if Labour don't call for a ceasefire, I won't be voting for them. Yeah, Jamie, mate, you're like in the really small minority of people who will want to use your vote for something that can't make a difference. Yeah? Doesn't matter what Labour call for. Doesn't matter what the Tories call for. Because we can't, we can't implement a ceasefire. This motion, whatever motion gets voted in favour of or loses this week, makes no difference. Makes no difference. Doesn't save a single life. Whereas if you vote for the party that's going to fix the NHS, that saves lives. If you vote for the party that's going to improve uh, pay, average pay in real terms, that, that improves lives as well as saves lives. If you're going to vote for the party that's going to make sure we've got enough housing, that saves lives because once you've got enough adequate housing, all of a sudden, most of the arguments against immigration melt away, right? Because there's two, there's two arguments when it comes to the old immigration. You might argue three, but there's two real ones. Oh, pressure on housing and pressure on jobs. Now, some people say pressure on the NHS and education as well, like public services, but most people recognise that there's more immigrants working in public services than using them. But, and you can prove that, that's easy. Even the government say that, even the Tories acknowledge that. But the two main ones are housing and jobs. Um, so if you take away the housing one, all there is is the jobs. And as long as you've made sure that people have got access to, you know, the, the better jobs, that melts away as well. So those are the things to vote on. Now, you can vote on whatever you like. If you want to vote on something that makes not a blind bit of difference, that's entirely up to you. But it, it, I am just going to call it out as utterly ridiculous. Utterly ridiculous to vote for, for vote. You're voting for unicorns, mate. Voting for unicorns. Uh, Grim saying uh, Labour have been calling for ceasefire since October. They have, but they kept calling it a humanitarian pause. I know Graham thinks that they should have just used the word ceasefire themselves, given that it is what they were calling for. They were trying to use different language. The re I'll tell you why they tried to use different language. And you can still argue, probably on balance, it was not the right decision. They want to, like a ceasefire is just that. You stop firing for a few hours while each side reloads and works out what their next targets are going to be. That's what a ceasefire is, right? That's what a ceasefire is. A ceasefire can last for like not even a day. So Labour wanted to avoid looking foolish by calling for something that lasts for two hours. Uh, and because everyone else was saying ceasefire, they wanted to, they thought to themselves, we want to differentiate ourselves by using different language, even though they were calling for the same thing. So it is actually true in terms of Labour's rhetoric has changed, but what they've been calling for is still the same, which is that they want, uh, they want a pe they want peace. Because peace is a ceasefire is war. When you're calling for a ceasefire, you're calling for the war to continue. Unless you're specifically calling for a ceasefire for the purposes of negotiating a lasting peace. But none of the people marching have called for that, you'll notice. Not one of them. Not a single speech that I've seen reported. I'm not listening to all the speeches live. But I haven't heard a single speech on, on one of these uh, platforms at the end of one of these marches where people have said, we want a ceasefire to be used for the discussion of um, the terms of a lasting peace. I've never heard any of them say that, but there we go. Uh, Gary Arnold, last one, we'll have to go through the last few comments here, uh, saying Ofcom has launched an investigation to Rishi's recent appearance on Sky, uh, sorry, according to Sky News. I wouldn't get your hopes up about that. He appeared on GB News, of course. Uh, I won't get your hopes up about that. GB, uh, sorry, Ofcom have launched several investigations into GB News. And do you know what they always say? Oh, it's not a news channel. It's called GB News. Oh, yeah, it's not actually a news channel. They can do what they like. So forget about it. Uh, Alex saying we've got a friend in Tel Aviv. The protests are back. I keep hearing mixed things about what's going on in Israel itself. But but there we go. Um, uh, you say, no, a ceasefire is permanent. No, a ceasefire is only permanent if it is the cease. In fact, it's not, most ceasefires are not permanent. You have ceasefires... Like if you think about major wars, there were ceasefires in all of them. They were just pauses in the fighting. Um, the only ceasefire that ever becomes permanent is the one that is used to negotiate a lasting peace. Now, we know that the only lasting peace uh, where Israel and Palestine are concerned is the setting up of this two-state solution. And 
there's two things to consider. First of all, Hamas have rejected a ceasefire. They say there is not going to be another ceasefire. Uh, now they can change their mind, but that is their position at the moment. And the Israeli government have said that there is not going to be a two-state solution. So in actual fact, the ceasefire for the purposes of negotiating a lasting peace is impossible because both sides have rejected the, the, the principle of the notion of, of it, right? Both sides have rejected it. So in actual fact, any ceasefire is by definition temporary now with this specific one because the ceasefire that is used to negotiate a lasting peace is not possible because neither side wants it. It's really that simple. But anyway, it is what it is. Um, in fact, Gary said, I've reported things to Opcom. They are useless. They are useless, utterly. Uh, the first thing that needs happening when Labour come in is they need to give them some proper teeth and be told to use them. Like, there does need to be media reform, not just press reform. There needs to be media reform, although the press is the most unregulated form of media. But there are regulations currently in place. And some of those regulations pertain to GB News. And some of those regulations, you know, you don't have to reform anything just to tell Ofcom, start to apply the law properly, please. Uh, Tories have stacked Ofcom with their credits. Yeah, that's easily reversed. Um, but there it is. Uh, we'll have to call it there. We've run out of time. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, for coming on everyone have a great day uh, don't forget to click the like button and subscribe to the channel and until next time i'll see you later